in our minds, but help us to feel even in our innermost being the love of God right here. And Lord, as your word says to give thanks in all things, and we're in this week of Thanksgiving, and, and it's kind of, uh, for, for some of the world, it's almost like one of those things where, well, this is the time of year to be thankful, but we need to be thankful every day. And to be able to see the, the wondrous, beautiful, glorious creation that you have made. And yet, Lord, we are so heartbroken over the sin and perversion that has taken what you have created and has warped it. But Lord, help us to still see your fingerprints and to just rejoice with the things in which we are blessed with from you. Lord, I thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. And Lord, as we go to communion towards the end of the service, Lord, help, help us to be in preparation for that now as we look at your word and as we consider what you have done for us, for our, uh, for our salvation, for our redemption, and not just for something that takes place after we die, but Lord, the experience of having Christ with us right now. So, Lord, we bring you glory. I pray that you'll speak through your word and speak into my heart and into those who are here. For your name we pray. Amen. So, our topic for today, as we have been going through our core values, we're talking about authentic relationships. And just taking a quick peek at our list of core values, the authentic relationships is the seventh of these eight. If you remember the, the headship of Christ and the word of God, those, those two are on the top because those do come first. They are, uh, they are the, the predominant, important thing on this list. And then those other six really aren't in any sort of order. They just are all tangled up together. And this is a, th these things should be a part of our life. And we're, so we're looking at these things, one, as are they biblical? Well, we believe they are, and that's what we're looking at, seeing where, they, where these things come from in Scripture. And so authentic relationships, and what I want to attempt to do today is, first I want to just speak to our minds to start with, and look at Scripture and say, what does Scripture say about authentic relationships? And then I just want to make it a very practical, a very real and a very, almost one of those things that where, where, where I think you know this stuff, but I just want us to be able to see some things with fresh eyes. And now Thanksgiving time, we usually have a Thanksgiving message and it focuses in on giving thanks, right? And that's often what I would do. And so I'm just gonna say this, here's that portion of the message, be thankful in all things at all times, give glory to God. End of that message, okay? The other thing that we're going to talk about today, though, is something that's going to bring us into communion, and that is being invited in or inviting in to have people sit with you at your table. And that's going to be what we're going to be kind of focusing in on as we get into this, okay? So the first thing that we want to talk about is this, uh, just this core value, authentic relationships. We have this sentence in there that we include. We say, we seek relationships that are genuinely based, and we're using authentic and genuine interchangeably, genuinely based upon the love of Christ. That's what we are seeking to do as a church family. To have the relationship with one another based upon the love of Christ. So the question first off becomes, this, what attributes, what attributes will a relationship with others look like if that relationship is based on the love of Jesus Christ? So we're going to look at some scriptures, probably nothing too new, but I want you to just be aware of what we're looking at here. Romans 5.8, that's not it. There it is, Romans 5.8. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm not going to hang on each of these too long, but I do want to talk about a few things. That kind of love is a love that is undeserving, isn't it? 
while we were yet sinners, in his love, he died for us. So what kind of a love do we have in a relationship uh, that's based on a Christ-like love? Well, we, we're imperfect, aren't we? But we're going to be working towards being able to love, not because somebody necessarily deserves it, not because they first loved you, but because Christ loved you. You will love others while they are still offending you. Who is on board for that, right? Woohoo! Doesn't sound like fun always, but God calls us to that. Now, I will say this, I have the caveat. This doesn't mean that you never have boundaries with certain people. This doesn't mean that you just, you know, that you, that you don't have a little wisdom in the way you interact with people. But you seek to love in whatever context that relationship is at. And there have been people that have been very hard for me to love in my life, but I knew that God had called me to love them in a whole another way that, that, that I was called to do so, and, and so I did. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to try and get too sidetracked here. I, should, I really could. Uh, John 15, 13, there's no greater love than this, that a person would lay down his life for his friends. All right? Christ laid down his life for us. That kind of love. So it is a love that is one, not based upon a, a, uh, a reciprocating relationship necessarily, but I'm gonna love even though I've been offended, and it's gonna be a sacrificial kind of love. These are, these are Christ-like love attributes. We see it in Ephesians 5, 25. Paul Tanner, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Pick it on Paul because he just got married. Megan, so glad that you're here as well. I'm going to pick on people this morning. Husbands, love your wives. Now, I just want to say this. That doesn't mean that it's only our wife that we love this way, but this sets an example. Christ loved us this way, so love your wife that way. In other words, guys, start there. But we should love other people with a sacrificial kind of love as well. And then the one that makes it into most wedding ceremonies, 1 Corinthians 13. And if you know this passage, then you also probably know that in context, it's not talking about a marriage relationship. Although it applies to a marriage relationship, this is talking about the church. It's saying, hey, church people, in your church, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It is not conceited. It does not act improperly. It is not selfish. It is not provoked. It does not keep record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8, love never fails or it never ends. Authentic relationships don't just happen without some level of love. And by love, we are talking about making choices and being intentional. We're not talking about that necessarily butterfly feeling that you get with somebody, right? This is a choice. When the scriptures define love, it looks a whole lot like intentionality. You're going to be patient. That's what love is. All right. Unfortunately, we have all the wonderful movies that just make us feel like love is all about this. Woo, I'm going to get swept away. She knocks me off my feet, right? And I think that can be part of it. I'll be honest, my wife knocks me off my feet. Sometimes it hurts. <laughs> And then John 13, this is the uh, passage that we use with the authentic relationships core value. I give you a new command, love one another, just as I have loved you, 
you must also love one another. Right? So there's a command there to be in relationship, to be loving. And here is why. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, which means that we're giving God glory through the way we love, if you have love for one another. So these verses that we've just looked at, they certainly speak to the fact that we are to be in relationship and that Christ sets the example for the relationship. But what about this word, authentic? Authentic. Is that biblical or is that something that we just added in to be trendy? Well, Romans 12, 9 18, the first five words of this passage, love must be without hypocrisy, which is the opposite really of authentic, isn't it? Love must be without hypocrisy. And the rest of the passage is fantastic in, in talking about our relationships. Detest evil, cling to what is good, show family affection to one another with brotherly love, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lack diligence, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. And boy, verse 12 would have been a really good one for all churches to hang on to through COVID and all of that struggle. Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Well, that sounds like a whole lot of uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes, and if possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. And do this without hypocrisy. It's a challenge, isn't it? Because the whole idea of being authentic is that you're not just putting on a fake mask of trying to be hospitable, but you're actually seeking from the Lord to have a heart of hospitality. There's a difference there. First Peter 1.22 By obedience to the truth look at this, or this little section of words here, having purified yourself for sincere love. Purified Pure gold means that there's no, there's no other foreign elements in it. It's all gold, 100%. Pure love means that it's not sprinkled with all these other things of maybe envy and uh, hate. It's, we're talking about a purity of it for sincere love. And sincere really is another word for authentic as well. Love of your brothers, love one another earnestly from, again, a pure heart. Then 1 John 3, 18. Little children, we must not love with word or speech, but with truth in action. So love with truth. In other words, love has to be authentic. Love not with lies, which would be not authentic. So we can rightly explicate these things, guys. We are to love each other earnestly. That means with intention, without hypocrisy, from a pure heart, in truth, and in action. That's really what authentic is in this sense. And I also want to just take notice that it's a command. You know what I figure when I see a command in Scripture? That that means I've got a choice. I can either do it, or I can ignore it. And so... I think what it tells us to love without hypocrisy and love genuinely, that, that those are choices that we make. And that's where it gets a little tough. Now, I also want to just consider the fact that uh, we love because Christ first loved us. So we're loving from a place of being filled by him and from his love which we're going to look at in just a moment, a little bit more. But authentic, genuine relationships are not just going to happen. You're going to choose. 
And so what I want to focus on today is this, that any close relationship that you have is a relationship which has been fostered. Now, it's true, there might be some relationships that are easier than others, but even the easy ones, you've had to foster that relationship. You've had to put in effort. And maybe it starts off where it doesn't seem like a lot of effort, but as you go along in that relationship, you realize this takes work. Even with people you like, it takes work. It takes my wife more work than me. I promise you that. Uh, so, all right. Therefore, the thing that I want to consider today most is just this fostering of genuine relationships. How are we going to take these truths and these commands and foster them, grow them? And so that's what I want to focus on. The problem is, is that that could be a 10-hour sermon, which I'm not going to do. So I'm just going to zero in on one particular area. I'm not going to attempt to exhaust all the possible ways of fostering authentic relationships, but rather to draw awareness to one very practical method, something that you already know, something that takes place at Thanksgiving quite often, but with fresh eyes, and that is the importance of the dinner table. And maybe that seems just too elementary and too simple, but as you study scripture on being at the table and what it is to be invited into the table, you begin to realize there's probably more to it than what we consider as Midwesterners. But before we look at that, we need to, before we're looking at the action, we need to pause and consider about how we have to prepare our hearts and so, if we remember from 1 Corinthians as well, actions without love is like what? A clanging symbol. Remember the day that I was in here and crashed it and the Sawyer says, be quiet! I loved it. Exactly. So, the first element, the first uh, principle here in talking about love must be without hypocrisy. At, at the most basic level, we understand this is that our actions, our reactions, our words, our choices, our public lives and our private lives have to be lives of integrity. And they need to match up. And that means no wearing masks, no putting on a fake, I, I'm not talking about a COVID mask, I'm talking about a mask I'm talking about a mask of covering your face to make you look as though you are something that you aren't. Okay? So we need to prepare our hearts. There is not a split of self. There's not a division of who we are. There's not a church Steve and a home Steve. There's not a work Steve. Well, you are churches work for me, so. Uh, there's not a work J and a home J, right? There, there, there's got to be integrity there, a unity of who you are. And so those who will share in your walk of faith, this is what, Tam and I were talking about this this week, something that is so surprising for people as you become a part of a church family and people who are sharing in your walk of faith, you will find that when you are able to be honest and genuine and say, here are the areas where I struggle with sin. Here are the areas that I am hurting. Here are the areas that I struggle within my, my own walk. Those things don't push you away from people. They pull you closer. They endear you because people recognize, oh, they don't have it all together either. They need Jesus too. And so to, to be vulnerable, vulnerability holds with it an essence of really struggling together. When you're able to share your broken places, your struggles, 
instead of pretending that you've just got it all together. And, and the people who are going to be your greatest, most intimate friends are going to be people who have been with you through the hard things and the struggles. Some really dear friends of, of ours, uh, Mark and Brenda, they are from our church in Sibley, Iowa. They were volunteers with us, with the youth group, all the years that we were there. They have remained close friends to us. Marty has a, a prayer relationship with Brenda that's very regular. Brenda sends me every single morning a passage or a little clip of something that she prays over me. Every single morning. Now, we have been through some really great things with Mark and Brenda, and we've been through some hard things with Mark and Brenda. But there is not anything that we couldn't sit down and talk with them about. Now, Mark and I are both more introverted, so Brenda and Mark have talked much more than Mark and I do. But they kind of hold us together as well. But Brenda sent me something that kind of connects with this. She sent it this last week, and it was just this little just a little story. It said there's a seminary class going on, and uh, so there's a young guy who wants to be a pastor, and he asks the professor, he says, what do I need in order to be a good pastor? And the seminary professor said, you need empathy. Next question, how do you get empathy? And with a little bit of a look of sadness in his eye, the professor said, you suffer. One word, suffer. And I'm not going to read it for you right now, but 2 Corinthians speaks to that very clearly. That when you go through things, when you go through hard things, it's those very things that God will use in your life through your weaknesses to, to minister to others. And so, we talk about compassion, and in this passage, it talks about the God of all compassion, who meets us in our need, and where we have been shown compassion, we are able to show others compassion. This word is very thick in there, and that connects with empathy, compassion, empathy. And it is derived, compassion, the word compassion is derived from two Latin words, and those words mean, uh, mean to suffer with. To suffer with. So compassion for brokenness comes from brokenness. There's really no other way. So guys, when we try to cover up and put the mask on and pretend that we are something we're not or that we just got all together, or try to come off as being self-righteous somehow, we are really committing two crimes. One crime against yourself and one crime against others. The crime against yourself is you will remain in a trap, you will be told a lie, and you will begin to believe that because an accuser is accusing us saying you're broken, you're no good, you can't get away from this, it's too hard, and you are stuck in this trap. And there's no way out. That's what Satan would tell you. But guys, when when you begin to confess your sins and confess your hurts and be able to say what needs you have, that just wipes away the power of Satan having this over you. It's not a trap that's closed in on you. You can walk out of it. Do you guys remember Pastor Dan telling me that? Bob, Sandy, uh, Pastor Dan, my, my former pastor up in Cocado, he, he would always talk about the live trap. But, we're, we're in this trap, like a live trap, like the raccoon in the trap, but the door's open. You can walk out. Satan makes you think that you're stuck in the trap in your face, but you just got to turn around and walk out. Crime number two, it's against others, and that is this, is if you try to cover up those things in your life, then you are rendered useless from being able to have compassion and share that, those things needs with others because God uses our weaknesses for his glory all right so that's biblical principle principle number one number two is that 
In the verse it says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples. He is the resource. The love that we have for others comes from him. Right? I'm going to move on here. Thirdly, little children, we must not love with word or speech, but with truth and with action. Love is a verb. Thank you, DC Talk, for teaching me that back in high school or college, wherever we were then. Love is an action. It is a choice. And this is where I want to get real practical today. We're going to be sitting around Thanksgiving tables this week. Uh, and so our, our minds go to the table. And I just want to bring maybe a fresh look at what it is to be invited in to sit at someone's table. Or for you to invite somebody in to sit at your table. I want to go first to Luke 19. So I'm going to read a few passages for you. Luke 19, 1 through 10. You'll know the story. Jesus entered Jericho. He was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd, since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today I must stay at your house. So he quickly came down and he welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain, he's gone to lodge with a sinful man. Now it doesn't say it here that they had a meal together, but this is part of the hospitality of bringing somebody in, was that they would eat together, they would provide, okay? But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, I'll give half my possessions to the poor Lord, and if I have extorted anything from anyone, uh, extorted, not extorted, <laughs> extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. So people see that he's going to stay with this sinner, and, and they begin to complain. We're going to look at another verse that's very similar, Matthew 9, and I'm not putting these up here, so just listen along here. Matthew 9, 10 and 11, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with them and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Just like these others were complaining about him going to Zacchaeus. Right? See, the significance of going in and sitting and eating with somebody at their table was great. Probably even greater than what we would understand it to be here. It speaks loudly because when you sit and you eat together, what you are saying is, I am accepting you. I am receiving you. I find you valuable. So the reason why these people were complaining was that by Jesus eating with them, he was, he, he was saying that he accepts them. He receives them. In fact, what does he say to Zacchaeus? He says, you are a son of Abraham because of his repentance. Of course, we know that Jesus did only eat with the unclean, but he touched them. So I want to just give you a little more information, some of the depth of what it was to eat and to be at one another's table in the Old Testament, and especially with Middle Eastern cultures. So one is in Genesis 31, 51 to 54. Again, I'm not putting it up here. You just have to follow along. You'll probably know the story. But being brought in together signifies kinship and friendship and goodwill towards one another. Genesis 31, 51 to 54. Laban also said to Jacob, Look at this mound and the marker I have set up between you and me. 
this mountain is a witness and the marker is a witness that I will not pass beyond this mountain to you and you will not pass beyond this mountain to me and this marker to do me harm. In other words, this was that story where I'm going to take that part of the land, you take this part of the land, okay? And then it says, verse 53, the God of Abraham and the gods of Nahor, the, the gods of their father, will judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and invited his relatives to eat a meal. So they ate a meal and spent the night on the mountain. So there's this kinship, a friendship, an agreement. We go even deeper with the agreement aspect in Genesis 26, 28 to 30. They replied, we have clearly seen how the Lord has been with you. We think there should be an oath between two parties, between us and you. Let us make a covenant. You will not harm us, just as we have not harmed you, but have only done what was good to you, sending you away in peace. You are now blessed by the Lord. So they prepared a banquet, and they ate and drank together. And then if you just consider, if you go through the, the Old Testament law and think about how there were uh, 400 years there where they set up a calendar, which was a calendar of meals. There's this banquet, there's that feast, there's this feast, okay? So we have that aspect of it. Now in the Jewish tradition, after, this, after the temple was destroyed for the second time, the Jewish Talmud records this, all right? So this isn't in scripture, this is the Jewish Talmud. It says, and now that we no longer have the temple, in Jerusalem, and its altar to bring about atonement for sin, a person's family table gains reconciliation and forgiveness. There's a, a huge weight on coming around the table together. This is going to start to make a whole lot of sense to you and get really cool here in just a moment. Luke 22, 14 to 19. We're talking about, let's see here. There we go. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. And he said to them, I am eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and he gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're going to go to the table in just a little bit, but we're not quite to the uh, epitome of what's taking place here. So after that meal, do you remember what takes place? Like, what happens to the disciples right after this? Jesus washes, Jesus washes their feet, and then what? takes place. Do, do you, the Garden of Gethsemane whole situation there? Judas is betraying him. And then what do the other disciples do? They scatter, don't they? Now, John 21, 7 through 9. This is the second of, oh no, this is the third appearance to the disciples. And you also even remember the first appearance, uh, maybe, but I just want to point this one out. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken off. Now Simon Peter, remember, he's the guy that denied Jesus, right? And he jumps into the water, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, there was fish on it, and some bread. Jesus invites them back to have a meal with them, with him again. There is another element in this, in which there is a uh, let's see here, where's my notes? There is an Arabic meaning of reconciliation called a solah, 
I, I didn't probably say it wrong, but it's a meal shared between two parties when they break bread, and the breaking of bread together means the offense is done. It's over. So in this culture, there's a sense of we'll break bread together. What I have been offended by from you and what I have offended you, it's over. It's finished. It's done. Now, you and I. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. He has invited you to sit at this table. The offense is done. He's inviting you in to commune with him. There's going to be a day when we get to sit at the table with Christ there. What we do now is we have communion together. I'm going to have the elders come up. We have communion together. And as Jesus said there at that last supper, he said, do this, keep doing this in remembrance of me. And there's two parts to that remembrance. One, we're remembering what Christ has done for us on the cross. And we are looking forward to when we get to be at that banquet table with him in heaven. We have been invited in to break bread with him. And we are invited to do it together. So as we go to our Thanksgiving tables, even this, this coming week, and, and the week forward, who are you inviting to your table? It means so much. I think we need fresh eyes of seeing this. That there is an intimacy at a, at a table that just doesn't take place when you bump into each other at the store. Um, I know it's complex. And I know that there can be hard feelings and hurt relationships. But when you sit at a table and you invite somebody in, and especially strangers or other people, you can look around you and think, and we add them to our table. And don't overcomplicate it. Inviting to your table could be as easy as going to McDonald's and having a cope with each other. Okay? Don't overcomplicate it. It can be that easy. We are invited to the table, and we're going to come to the table today. Now, just so you know, if, if you would prefer to have your own individual little cup and wafer, those are on the back table there. You're welcome to do that. Otherwise, we will do what's called intention. That means you'll be ripping off a piece of bread and dipping it into the cup. And you do not need to be a member of Cornerstone in order to partake in communion. You need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because it's his table. And so he's inviting you to his table. And so we're just going to take a moment to reflect on areas in our life where we might need to just say, Lord, I need your forgiveness for this. And I want to come to your table and I want to be in pure purity, truth, without hypocrisy. And so that just means, so that doesn't mean that I never made a mistake or sin. It just means that I need to come without hypocrisy. I need to, to say, here's my sin. And I know that you've died for it. Take it. Father, I pray that you would bless this cup and this bread today as we partake together. Lord, I pray for our own hearts to come before you with maybe a new awe of what it is to be brought into your table as a, as a sign of reconciliation. Lord, that you have invited us in as your family. Father, I pray that we would understand the, the great inferences here, the, the rippling effect of being forgiven and finding ourselves standing before you clean, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ that we can walk out of the trap, that we can be honest and say, this is who I was, but no more. I am a new creation in Christ, and I can walk forward with courage and strength, knowing that Christ is with me. Lord, we thank you for your broken body, which was broken for us. We thank you for your shed blood, which took our sin and put our sin to death. 
They gave us life. God, we glorify in your name. Amen. When you are ready, you can come up and take. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he broke the bread and said, this is my body which has been broken for you. In the same way, after giving thanks, he took the cup said, this is my blood which has been shed for you. I will be over on this side, over by the keyboard with some gluten-free bread. If you are gluten-free, that is available.
for some reason, you've chosen to invite us to your table. And we don't really eat with people we don't want, and we don't really eat with people we don't like. So we thank you that you've chosen us to be not only your children, but your friends. Um, that the greatest love of all is to lay down one's life, and you did that for us. God, so help us to live accordingly. Help us to choose truth, to choose obedience, Convict us in the areas of our life where we are failing, where we are choosing sin over our Savior. God, I pray that this communion time, would it be just something we do, another thing to take off the list for the month. But I pray that this communion, would be, communion time would be a reminder that we have been invited in to the God of the universe's banquet. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you to live like we get to have dinner with you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I just a reminder, uh, offering, there's a little white church on the back table in the narthex. So if you have anything, you can put that there. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. Go on, peace. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, guys. See you later.